Hi, today we're going to be talking about how we can address diversity from a educational psychological perspective. So this is an issue that will um, be woven throughout all of your classes in education, but today I want to really think about it from the educational psychology perspective. So today we're going to talk about uh, the rise of multiculturalism, um, ethnicity and social class um, as it relates to the classroom. Then we'll talk about cultural competency in education and we'll end with um, a little bit of a discussion on bilingual education. So let's look at multiculturalism. Um, and the first thing I want to talk about is this idea about a melting pot versus cultural pluralism. So you may have heard the saying like America is a melting pot. And um, that's really a view that's pretty outdated. Um, it's really assuming uh, this assimilation that if we put all of these different cultures together, we get one kind of homogenous um, similar culture. So it would be the idea if we put a bunch of different cheese, different types of cheese into a fondue pot, it would all melt together and kind of create one, one consistency, one all of the same. And um, we don't really value that anymore. And, and usually when we talk, when people talk about a melting pot, what comes out is that we want all these other cultures to assimilate to one American culture. And that American culture usually tends to be something that's white, Protestant, what would um, think about the majority culture um, in our society. Um, and instead, we want to think maybe more about cultural pluralism or this idea that we could all respect and maintain our diverse cultures within our society. So think of it more like a salad. So we have all of these different pieces and parts of a salad that are distinct. Um, but when we bring them all together, it creates a rich tapestry that makes our society better. Um, so that we're not asking anyone to change who they are or what their, what their culture or society is, but that when we bring them all together, it makes all of our experiences richer. Um, so we're going to move away from the melting pot analogy and more towards a salad. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the changing demographics um, in our um, society. So I want to look first at the 2010 census. In the United States, you can see um, in 2010, it was about 72% white and 13% black. Um, and then in Florida, we can see that population of white decreased, um, and we have a much higher percentage of um, both a little bit higher black, but also a much higher percentage of Hispanic and Latino or Latino um, people. Um, and then let's look at specifically at Duval County, which is higher percentage white than the Florida population and a much lower percentage of Hispanic and Latina um, or Latino peoples. And we can think about that because we are in the northern part of Florida and we can think about the Hispanic population of Florida really being centered more um, around the Miami area. Okay, so that's overall, but I also want to consider how the demographics change when we talk about just the school population. So let's compare the United States population to the United States school population, and you can see that the percent white um, in the school population is much less than um, in the overall population. Um, and that's um, in CES. If we look at the Florida Department of Public School population, um, we even see a lower percentage um, of white students and in Duval County specifically. Um, this is 2019 versus 2010, so we're not really comparing apples to apples here, but the Duval County school population is only about 34% white, um, whereas in 2010, the Duval County overall population was about 60% white. That's a huge difference, and a couple of things account for this. One is that um, our white population is significantly older, um, in in Florida in general and in Duval County and specifically, um, they um, the so older without school age children. Um, also, um, that we also have sort of a white flight situation in Duval County where many of the white families have chosen not to put their kids in public schools, but we have a disproportionate amount of white students in our private schools in Duval County. So that explains the differences, and we can think um, it's really important to think about this. We think about who's voting for things like 
school board elections and also things like um, increasing taxes to support our school systems. Um, if we have a huge, if we have a large percentage of our population whose children don't attend the public schools and or who don't have children, they might not be as in favor of supporting our schools through public policies, right? So I do think it's important to look at the differences between the population of the country versus the population of the schools and how that might have changed over time. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how ethnicity and social class and how that might affect our schools. So um, the effects of ethnicity or race on learning, um, the textbooks tend to say ethnicity, but we also want to, I want to note that ethnicity and race have slightly different meanings. Um, so we know that different races um, and different ethnicities, different cultural backgrounds have different verbal communication patterns. So um, how you tell a story and narrative effect, um, the way, how loudly you speak, um, the way that you, the words that you use um, are all different. Um, and that might affect our learning. And also our nonverbal communication, things like eye contact, how, um, how much you use your hands, um, how, close you stand to someone. All of those things vary by ethnicity. Um, our time orientation. So depending on our culture, um, our culture in America tends to say things like time is money and we, we put a, a strong value on being on time and being punctual. In fact, we would leave a conversation or leave a relationship um, because we'll be late for a new commitment. Um, in other cultures, um, we would stay in the conversation that we're having right now um, and be late to the next thing because what's important is the immediate thing that we're doing, not a future date. Um, so it's just, it's a different orientation, which could create conflicts in the school, right? Um, social values, so things like our value on competition or individualism um, differs across cultures. Um, and instructional formats and learning processes. So the way in which we instruct um, that di very didactic, um, stand in front and have everyone sit in individual chairs in high school or controversial or conversely a really a group environment like you might see more in elementary school or hands on learning might be very different from the culture that a student might be coming from. And when we think about these effects of ethnicity on learning and all of these kind of generalizations, we want to think about both micro and macro cultures. So a macro culture is um, something like the United States or um, or even like being white in the United States or being black in the United States, um, or it could be being German or being Japanese, right? Um, a microculture would tend to think more about your individual family circumstances or even maybe your neighborhood. So a microculture, while um, I might come from white um, Protestant background, my family might value um, group um, centered things more than a rugged individualism that you might um, expect. So we can think about how families might differ um, individually and also how groups of people might interact differently. Um, we also want to think about the effects of social class on learning. So um, we talk about social class, we can talk about socioeconomic status or SES as it's commonly called, which is our relative standing um, in society, basically um, our income, but it's not just income, it, can also, it also includes kind of our social capital. So things like education that we have, where we live, um, our, the organizations we belong to, the kinds of things that we know how to do. Um, leads us to our socioeconomic status. Um, in schools, we oftentimes distinguish, we measure socioeconomic status through um, whether or not a student qualifies for free and reduced lunch, which is purely based upon income and doesn't take other things into account, and it's a really rough measure. So um, SES um, affects health status, so our ability to access health care um, is absolutely dependent upon the type of job that I have and the health insurance that comes with that or whether or not I have health insurance. Um, my living conditions, um, which could also affect my health um, and a number of other factors, so exposure to lead, um, exposure to the outdoors, um, breathing and asthma. Um, a, to environmental concerns and also um, if I have access to a quiet place to do my homework or how stressful um, my life is and we know that stress and that cortisol um, hormonal aspect to being under constant stress um, is a detriment to learning that if I'm under stress I am not able to function at a high cognitive level sometimes. 
of my family environment, how much support that I have, and again, the stress of having parents fighting. Um, or the stress my family might feel if I'm experiencing homelessness or job loss or um, even um, scarcity of food, all of those things can contribute to um, a lower um, or lower achievement in schools. Also access to things like books and the vocabulary that my family presents me with. The more words my family says, the more words that are around me, that is a high correlation to my later literacy development. And beliefs and attitudes about school. So if I come from a situation where my, my family hasn't, has experienced um, systemic um, prejudice in my school system, they're less likely to um, buy into that system. And so if my family has been discriminated against um, in school, they might be less likely to want to participate in that um, environment or believe that that is a place that I could be successful. If I don't have any role models um, that show me that doing well in school is going to um, give me wealth or give me success in life, I might be might have a lower level of motivation. If no one in my family and no one in my neighborhood, no one that I can see has graduated from high school or those that have graduated from high school, um, I haven't seen a benefit to their life. If they haven't been able to um, secure employment, then I might not think that school, I might be very motivated for school to um, to continue if I don't see the effects of that. I might have low motivation and that could be completely dependent upon the neighborhood and the role models that I have, right? Um, I need to know that it's gonna be helpful in the future. Um, and then my achievement levels are all things that um, we know that socioeconomic status has a huge correlation with achievement. And there's probably lots of other factors that I just listed that affect um, that achievement. And we know that there's a differential in graduation rates by um, socioeconomic status um, as well. So how do um, race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status affect teacher expectations? Um, so the first thing is that teachers form expectations based upon race and social class. Um, whether that is explicit or um, implicit, that sometimes our society just kind of trains us to do this, that we might not be actually thinking this um, consciously, but our subconscious might have these expectations. We develop an expectation about a child. Um, then we communicate this to students. So we communicate our expectations to students um, by the type of work that we give, by the types of things that we accept from them, by the type of motivation that we give. Um, and we either explicitly or tacitly or both communicate these expectations to students and then students conform to those expectations. So we talk about having high expectations for all learners and really that's what this is about that that because we have um, so much in our society um, um, internalized um, racism and classism um, within ourselves that we sometimes have lower expectations for these groups of students and that creates this cycle of effects in which they don't achieve as highly. So, um, and this research really largely supports this and here's some um, examples. Um, middle SES students um, are expected to receive higher grades than low SES students. Um, teachers have the highest expectations for Asian students. Um, they direct more positive statements to white students, even though negative statements stay the same. Thus, white students tend to get more praise um, while um, in relation to the negative statements they might receive. Um, they perceive low SDS backgrounds to be less mature with more behavior issues. They're more influenced by negative information um, than positive information. So once we start that cycle of low expectations, it tends to, um, to spiral downwards. Um, also, like students that are more attractive tend to be perceived as more capable. And attractiveness probably has a lot to do with SCS, right? So if I can afford nice clothes, if I can afford um, to take a shower, and if I can afford to, to spend the time to do my hair and those types of things, um, yeah, it's, it's related, right? If I can afford braces and dental care. Um, and I tend to approve of girls' behavior more than boys' behavior, which leads to those expectational differences. 
Um, so we know that all of this has been really found in the research. So how can I as a teacher um, combat this? And that's where cultural competence and education comes in. The book talks about multicultural education, which is um, another important aspect, but cultural competence is the um, another term that I want you to become familiar with. Um, a little bit more modern. So cultural competence and education talks about awareness of my own cultural identity and views about difference, and then my ability to learn and build on varying cultural communities. So it's about my understanding my own cultural identity and then being able to learn from others in the community of norms around me. Um, and I think that's really important because oftentimes, especially um, for all of my students in this class who, who are white or who identify as white, and we don't oftentimes think about us having a cultural identity because we're part of the majority. Um, but it's important that we understand that that white isn't the default. It isn't the the norm that that when we do that, then we then we're assuming that all other races are the exception or out of the norm. So it's important that I know that I come in with biases, that I come in with my own culture, which is white, and that the other that that other groups who are in my classroom um, also have their own cultural identity that might be different than mine, but are just as valuable, and that mine isn't necessarily the default or the norm, it's just one of many. Um, and that I can understand the within group differences that make each student unique and the between group the variations that make our country a tapestry. So that's why I was talking about the micro and macro cultures that um, that African, let's talk about African American or black culture is um, makes our own society richer and deeper and um, beautiful, right? But that even within within black the black community, there's lots of variations that I can't make um, an assumption about a student just based upon the color of their skin or their ethnicity, but I can appreciate the broader culture and what that brings to my classroom and my society. Um, and this understanding informs and expands my practices um, as a culturally competent educator. And this slide, um, and um, the link at the bottom of this PowerPoint on these slides links to a lot more information for the National Education Association on cultural competency. If you're interested, and I encourage you to follow up with that information. So um, the first thing is to value diversity, to accept and respect differences and cultural differences, different ways of communicating, different traditions and values. And this is where multicultural education usually kind of stopped. This idea that I really do value the differences in my classroom and I celebrate them. Um, then it's being culturally self-aware that my individual experiences, knowledges, and beliefs shapes my sense of who I am and how I fit into this school so that I understand that my culture isn't the default. It isn't the, the norm necessarily, but it is who I am and how I bring something to this group. And I recognize that. I recognize that maybe as um, as a white person, I have maybe have had privileges or expectations that are different than um, people of color who might be in my classroom. That might be one way to approach it, right? Or that my experiences um, don't necessarily mirror the experiences of the students in my classroom and how I can share that with my students. And the dynamics of, of difference, knowing what can go wrong in cross-cultural communications and how to respond. And this can be really tricky and difficult. For me, um, as a teacher and as an educator, I've had to learn and grow. Um, race and ethnicity is not something that's comfortable for me to talk about. Um, and I'm always afraid of stepping on toes or, or um, messing things up. And I, I have to know how to communicate and know that sometimes things do go wrong and they don't always communicate well and knowing how to be respectful of my students and their feelings and their experiences and creating a place in my classroom where everyone feels comfortable to share their own experiences and how they um, are recognizing their culture and knowing that helping facilitate that between my students might create conflict as well. So making sure that my students also have those skills and I have those skills to resolve those conflicts. So those are the uh, knowledge of students culture. So having some knowledge, some base knowledge of what my students bring. And again, depending on where you are, that might be a really diverse group of cultures. You might have to learn more about specifics of migrant populations, of cultures from across the world and um, being 
um, under being able to understand their behaviors through that context and being open to not necessarily labeling something as lazy or as a misbehavior until you understand the cultural context for which the student is coming from. And then um, institutionalizing this and adapting to diversity so that knowing how institutions work to, um, to institutionalize um, racism and then working to change that in your school and your society so that we can provide equal opportunities and advanced opportunities for students who might be facing disadvantages um, and to most best serve the students in your classroom. So here's the five areas. And again, um, the National Education Association um, on this page can provide a lot deeper understanding of these five competencies, skill areas. So let's talk a little bit about bilingual education and how that relates to language. So language diversity is another aspect of diversity. Um, so there's kind of three main ways that we could think about and classify bilingual education programs. We have transition programs, which teach students in their native language or partial native language until they're able to be proficient. And the goal here is to move into English dominant classes as quickly as possible. So a student might be in a primarily native language class for a year or two and then move into an English speaking class really quickly with support from an ESOL class along the way. So we're we're transitioning from native to excuse me from a native from their native language or bilingual class to um, an English majority class as quickly as possible. A maintenance program is to maintain or improve native skills. So there's significant instruction in the native language before moving into English. So it's kind of the opposite of the transition program where we're really we're really trying to really deepen their native language instruction for a long period of time so they don't lose that native language as we instruct them in English and bring that English in slowly and gradually. So the goal here isn't necessarily to move them to an all English classroom very quickly. The goal is to maintain that bilingual status of the students. And then finally, there's a two way bilingual program or a dual language program where the subject matter is provided in both languages. So for example, um, English and in Spanish. Um, and the classroom would include both native speakers, native speakers of both languages. So I would have maybe half a class of English speakers and half a class of native Spanish speakers. I would spend half my instruction in Spanish, half my instruction in English, so that everyone is learning both languages. Um, and we're really fostering that cross-cultural um, development. Um, so quality two language two way language programs or dual language programs um, that we have at least six years um, of this program. So it needs a deep, deep um, instruction over a long period of time to be successful. Um, that we have high quality instruction in both languages. So it's important that we're getting that both native both of the native languages um, are fully supported with um, fluent speakers. Um, that we oh, that there's a clear separation of the two languages for instruction so that specific parts of the day are devoted to English and in specific for Spanish and that we're not really crossing over between so that that language development is facilitated for all students. Um, and that we're using the language for at least 50% of the time. So if that minority language is Spanish, that Spanish is spoken for at least 50% of the time. Um, and then there's a rough balance of native speakers of each language that so we have about 50% of each in the classroom. So they can be used as peer tutors so that each native language is really valued within the school. And what we show is that we have a lot of really strong research support for this dual language support. And that when we started really early, those six years of those six years are elementary school. And that's when language acquisition is really happening in the brain. And we see really long-term benefits for both the native Spanish and the native English speakers um, in these types of programs. And Duval County has a few dual language elementary schools um, as part of their magnet programs, which is really truly amazing that we have, that we can be such leaders in this um, in Florida. Um, so as we reflect upon today, I want you to think about how the demographics of schools differ from the demographics of larger populations and how this might have changed over time. Um, think about how race and ethnicity affect student achievement and teacher expectations. Um, and same with social class. How does that affect um, teacher expectations, both explicitly and tacitly? 
and how, what you can do as a teacher to change that and to change your expectations and your um, the way that you view students. Um, and finally, what are the models of bilingual education and what does research say about their effectiveness? So as you contemplate these things, again, um, this is a really important topic in our um, study of education throughout your career at UNF. Um, so this won't be the only time you visit these topics, but I hope that you can really tie them into what you know about educational um, psychology. And if you have any questions, again, feel free to email me, call me, get in touch with me. I'd be happy to discuss these further. Thanks, bye.